Well, hello and welcome back to Bottomless Coffee. I'm your host, Jerome Evans, and on this show, we sit down with people for conversation over a cup of something delicious. For me, that's usually coffee, but our guests can drink whatever they want, as long as they come with a fresh perspective that we can all grow from. Today, we're exploring the puzzle that is long COVID with Kate Vaxed But Not Relaxed Murray, Program Manager of Long COVID for the Minnesota Department of Health. Hey, Kate, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, okay, so vaxed but not relaxed <laughs> makes me a little anxious. <laughs> Can you tell us what is long COVID? Uh, why are you worried about it? And, you know, I did some Googling. Why is it being kind of studied under the chronic diseases department at the Minnesota Department of Health? Yeah, for sure. Well, long COVID is the name of symptoms that are occurring four weeks or longer after a COVID infection. So okay. really this can last for even years now. People who have had it since 2020, it could be a new chronic condition. So we are thinking of it as such. And it is also called long haulers or long haul COVID. You may hear it referred to as post-COVID conditions or post-acute sequelae of COVID-19. Um, but okay. this is all talking about symptoms that are ongoing um, after the initial infection. Okay, so it's all about the symptoms. It's not about like the shape of the virus or making you feel long and gumby-like mm. or something. It's because the symptoms last for at least four weeks. So after the four week mark is sort of when they start considering it to maybe be long COVID. Okay. That is the CDC's definition. World Health Organization looks at it three months or longer. Um, but basically oh. after someone is recovered or maybe they just never recover, they may have new symptoms pop up. They may have symptoms that ebb and flow um, that are coming and going for months or even years after that infection. So that is the long haul sort of nature of long COVID. Okay. A post-acute sequelae. How'd I do? Okay, thank you. Yes. If I break that down, I feel like it's like after the acute uh, symptoms. So is that what sequ sequelae is? So that is referring to conditions that might pop up after the infection. So when we talk about PASC, which is the short name of that long weird word, okay. we may be talking about things like uh, cardiovascular events. We've seen that there's an increased risk of cardiovascular events like stroke or embolism in the year following a COVID infection or increased incidence of diabetes. We may see increases in dementia longer term because there are impacts on the brain. So. Uh, long COVID, a lot of people think of it as sort of that chronic version of the disease, but there's also this whole other side where there could be other conditions that are exacerbated by um, the virus that causes COVID. Okay, uh, hold please, because <laughs> it's my understanding from uh, 2020 slash 2021, that the symptoms that we really needed to worry about were like losing your sense of smell or uh, an intense cough, but I think you were just describing the symptoms of long COVID. And I didn't hear coughing or not smelling. <laughs> well, those can be symptoms of long COVID. And that's part of what makes this so tricky is that it, it looks different in everyone. And there are over 200 symptoms reported for long COVID. So we are starting to see sort of clusters of symptoms or subtypes that may be based on which um, systems of the body are being impacted by the virus or perhaps an, a new autoimmune disease that has emerged. Um, there are theories around microclots, ongoing inflammation, viral reservoirs, reactivation of other viruses. There's sort of all different underlying mechanisms that may be at play and then they present as different clusters of symptoms. And sometimes those are things like loss of sense of smell or altered sense or taste even a year after the code of COVID infection, it could be chronic cough, could be oh. headaches, um, really extreme fatigue after any exertion, physical or even mental. There are lots and lots of symptoms and it looks different in everyone. So it makes it hard to diagnose, hard to measure, uh, hard to treat. That's uh, concerning mm -hmm. and interesting. Hence the not relaxed part. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I think about this whole COVID, COVID episode that we've been dealing with, and it's been several years now. And for instance, uh, I was super stressed out. I've been stressed out for a long time, Kate. 
um, but particularly stressed out during all the lockdowns. And I was grinding my teeth at night. And uh, that stress, that anxiety, I don't know if that's like, like what symptoms uh, that I'm gonna live with long term are the result of that stress and anxiety and which are long term COVID systems, uh, symptoms, especially if there are like hundreds of them being cataloged. That's your job. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. indeed. And our, our wonderful healthcare partners. But yes, there are, you know, impacts on anxiety, depression, and um, there can be mood changes. And it's really hard to tease that out from all the pandemic stress that everyone was under, the isolation and just the, you know, not being sure about what was going on. It's It can lead to mel mental wellness issues. So I think you know, teasing all that apart is hard too, and it leads people to not be believed around their long COVID symptoms. People dismiss it as, oh, well, it's just it's just anxiety. Yeah. Um, sometimes even providers aren't aware of how this can show up. So it's really important that we get the word out that this is a real thing. This is definitely a real condition people are experiencing. Um, and if they're noticing anything like this, to try to talk to their provider about it and find support. How would I, this is so uh, self-interested. How would I avoid getting, <laughs> what if I just shortchange that whole conversation? Yeah, I'd, understandable. Well, the best way to avoid long COVID is to avoid COVID-19. So that's avoid oh. getting infected or reinfected with the virus that causes COVID-19. And, you know, we know for some people that has already happened, mm -hmm. but I would uh, encourage caution still going forward. Right now, that's the only real prerequisite for long COVID is having had um, COVID-19 infection. So for some people, if they got really, really sick or they had underlying conditions, it might increase their risk of long COVID. But there are also a lot of people who were perfectly healthy. Um, we've talked to a lot of like athletes and folks who had a COVID infection and have long-term symptoms. So the best thing you can do is just avoid COVID-19, stay updated on your vaccinations um, and protect yourself from the virus. Okay. Uh follow-up question to that. Let's say I got COVID alpha. I don't know. Was, was that the original alpha? <laughs> Wild type and then alpha. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I think I was supposed to be good for a little while. Um, but then I got reinfected with Omicron, let's say. Um, is my chance, this is, you're not going to have the answer. <laughs> is my chance of getting long COVID the same for like both instances? Because like what I have a lot of questions for you. That's um, what is the percentage of like, what's the likelihood I'm gonna get long COVID if I get COVID? Yeah. And then is it the same likelihood every time I get COVID? Ha, I figured that question out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got the question out. We just have to figure out the answer. I think, you know, we will learn as more variants emerge if they may be more or less likely to result in long COVID. I think we are seeing even with quote unquote milder variants like Omicron, there are people who still haven't fully recovered or, or who are having these long-term symptoms. So even people who have had a mild or asymptomatic case of COVID the first time can end up with long COVID. It's not just severe infections. As far as reinfections, I don't think we have data yet in how likely you might be to have long-term symptoms, but we have seen people who have had long COVID from earlier versions of the virus will then have kind of relapses in a lot of their symptoms when they are reinfected. So once again, just great to avoid it. Um, yes. <laughs> use that layered protective approach when you can. And for me, it's part of, you know, we all have our own sort of risk tolerance and I sort of factor this into my calculus of if I'm gonna go to that, you know, crowded event this week or an yeah. indoor gathering and keeping an eye on like the different community spread and, and numbers that are out there to continue avoiding COVID. Now I got Johnson & Johnson, which at the time was what was available. So mm -hmm. I took it, um, that's no longer recommended. I then got a booster. I've only had the one booster cause I, I am old, but I'm under 50. Um, so I think I'm where I'm supposed to be, but there are people who are not eligible to get vaccines. We don't have vaccines for them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about the, li the littles yes. in particular. And uh, at that intersection, we're kind of like, we're kind of, we're kind of seeming over it, you know, frankly. And that concerns me, especially with regard 
to long COVID. Absolutely, and I think the, the little is really hoping in the next few months we'll see a vaccine for them. I can tell you, I have a daughter who's five, and when she turned five, I scheduled her vaccine like, for the next birthday. day. I did originally schedule it on her birthday, and then she called me up for being a monster, and I said, all right, we'll do it tomorrow. Uh, but I was so excited for her to have that level of protection. Uh, fortunately, we aren't seeing as many cases of long COVID in really little kids, um, with some of the more recent variants, we may see more severe acute infections, but um, still good to have that layered protection. And for folks who have you know, severely compromised immune systems um, or can't get the vaccine for another reason, it's still important for them to protect themselves, to mm -hmm. assess what situations they're in, and hopefully people around them will take it into consideration and take steps to protect them as well. Um, you know, I still think about when I wear a mask out and about, I don't know if I might encounter someone who is immunocompromised or you know, having cancer treatment or something. So just in case I were carrying some asymptomatic infection, I want to protect them. And so for me, it's until we have treatments and more answers around this stuff, it, I'm just sort of staying the course with personally. That is my approach. Well, I think it's a good one. I was, I was thinking about you. This, I knew this conversation was coming up and I was on an airplane. And then someone coughed. <laughs> that was bad enough. And then, but then a little baby started crying. And I was like, oh no, it would be so long until we knew that this child had developed the symptoms of long COVID because they'd have to be able to articulate that something was going on. And what came to my mind is like colorblindness. Mm. You know, there are people who don't know that they're colorblind until they're like 17. <laughs> And so it's almost like we're going to have to establish this whole system to like figure out if our kids are, you know, typical in the pre-COVID sense of the word. Absolutely. And, you know, they've been through like the pandemic and everything. So there could be all sorts of differences. And that is challenging. And, you know, we're working with healthcare providers and trying to convene groups around consensus guidelines for diagnosing and maybe even screening for long covid um, it's for some people it can show up as these difficulty concentrating and remembering things. A kid who is presenting that might get diagnosed with ADHD and, mm. and you know medicated for it. I think for us in public health, thinking about that on like a population and community level is is kind of scary, especially when we know there are a lot of other systemic issues uh, with vulnerable populations yeah. that those intersections could really increase disparities. Wow. Yeah, I know. I'm such a joy, aren't I? <laughs> well, it's good to be informed because I feel as though sometimes people don't understand or necessarily have, they maybe they haven't received the message of the real risks that they're taking. So I was at, I was going to get coffee just today and someone was like, oh, I finally got COVID. Uh, then, you know, I went ahead and gave it to my family because it was just a matter of time. And I was like, I was, I was in my mind, I was like, ma'am, can you just like let me know how old your family is? Like, what are their ages? Are they going to be OK? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> follow up with me in a year. Right. Yes. And there's definitely that attitude. I mean, people are tired and I get it. There's yeah. a lot of fatigue around even just talking about COVID. And when we bring up long COVID, it's like, oh, you're just, you know, you're trying to scare people. But the reality is we don't know the long term implications. Yeah. And I think of like chicken pox parties and things people had like when I was a kid to try to get it over with. And I just cannot emphasize enough. That's not a great idea. <laughs> For one thing, you could still get reinfected. We know that people, you know, 90 days or potentially even shorter periods of time can get reinfected with new variants that emerge. Mm. And with chicken pox, you know, we see shingles with polio. We saw some pretty serious implications a decade or decades later, we don't know yet what there's going to be from COVID. And again, just seeing how the virus can impact directly or indirectly every system in the body, yeah. I would rather not take chances, you yeah. know? So I would discourage getting it over with as much as possible. And I don't think, I don't know, you, you mentioned a lot of potential complications and issues. Um, and I think I recently read that diabetes is um, one, one potential uh, symptom. 
Yeah, there are some endocrine um, impacts potentially of yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> basically all the the systems that deal with hormones. Um, yeah, we may be seeing more um, diagnoses of, of diabetes following a COVID infection. So again, it is impacting just every system in the body. One of the theories is that it can attack the lining of the small blood vessels and. You got those all over the place. So that's oh. why people's symptoms can literally affect them from their head to their toes. You hear about like COVID toes and people get these awful sores on their feet and people are, you know, losing their hair and having skin rashes and everything. I mean, it really can impact every part of the body. I definitely thought I had COVID toes. <laughs> because I was just like on the couch, I was looking at my feet and I was like, what are these little spots? I don't know what they are. <laughs> I had a little bruises from chasing my dog around <laughs> on the outside, outside in the cold, you know. Um, but it's just, you never really know. And I think there's this like ever present concern, you know, that I've got one of the mystery symptoms of long COVID or what have you. And it's really reassuring. The news you're giving us isn't reassuring, <laughs> but it's good to know that there is someone at the Department of Health who is reading the papers, conducting, maybe not conducting the studies, I don't know, but at least no, reading we're not, the studies. we're not doing that. We're, we read a lot of research papers, for sure. But working to keep us safe. Absolutely. We think it's, it's really important. And again, could be affecting a large population of people. There are a lot of estimates around how common it is for people to develop long COVID. That range is somewhere between maybe 10 to 30%. Even if it's 10% of people, I mean, earlier this week, CDC said probably 60% of the population has had COVID. So it is still a lot of people, even when we're being conservative. So trying to track what the impacts are, not just the prevalence, but also how is it impacting people's lives? So we yeah. talk to a lot of people who have lost their jobs because of long COVID symptoms. I mean, it really, it can be mild or annoying in people, or it can be severe and debilitating. Mm. It really has emerged as potentially, which has been called the largest new entrant to the disability community in modern history. So if it's impacting your job or your school, um, it's important to work with employers and, and seek resources around that. So we're trying to understand where, like within systems too, we need to keep an eye out for how we can support people, what barriers there might be, for pursuing you know, services and benefits. Um, there's just a lot of opportunity in public health for us to uh, keep an eye on long COVID and support survivors. Woo. Indeed. So we're never, never bored. Never <laughs> Every day bored. it is new, you know, a lot of plates spinning, but it's a, absolutely a privilege to, to be in this position. It's really, we learn a lot every day. Um, there's more research that comes out and uh, we are, one of the only states in the country who have a dedicated program for long COVID. We're oh. sort of on the leading edge of this um, using some of our CDC health equity grant money for long COVID. So um, I think we're laying some really good groundwork in Minnesota to, to wrap our arms around this, um, hopefully a little bit ahead of the curve. But we know there are people right now today who are suffering with this, whose lives and mental health and family life are impacted by long COVID. So. It's sometimes it's hard to like shut the computer down and just stop yeah. because it's just there's a lot to do. Yes. Well, thank you for the work that you are doing. And I think we've got more to come, but let's take a quick coffee break and then dig into the details, even more details of <laughs> long COVID with Kate Murray. We are back with Bottomless Coffee talking with Kate Murray from the Minnesota Department of Health about long COVID. And here's the big takeaway from the first part of our conversation. Getting vaccinated against COVID-19 is the best way to avoid long COVID. Okay, like what else do we know about, like know for sure about long COVID? Mm -hmm. And then what else is being studied? Yeah, so one of the few things we know for sure is that you need to have had COVID-19 to get long COVID. That's one of the only, like I said, certain prerequisites for mm -hmm. long COVID. Um, there are certain conditions that may predispose someone to long COVID, but it's not a, uh, being healthy or young. Um, it's not a guarantee that you won't get long COVID. So 
Reducing your risk of severe illness is a great idea. Again, okay. vaccination is one of the best ways to do that. Um, and yeah, so there's a lot we, we need to know, including why some people get it and why others do not. Yeah, well, that's, do we, I don't know, if, have we ever figured out like why some people are symptomatic with to COVID and why others are not? It's, I don't think we have great explanations around that. Um, I know even for kids, some of them seem to be able to avoid infection pretty well, but we don't quite know why yet. So. There's a lot to learn about the underlying mechanisms of COVID and long COVID. Um, and there are all of these theories around like the microclots and the inflammation and the viral reservoirs. And as we learn more about that, it can help with treatment, especially so that we can actually target the underlying mechanisms. But there is that huge NIH grant that's focused largely on the clinical research side of things. Okay. Um, at MDH, we're more of the public health side of things, so really looking at like the population and community level of impact. Aha, you said the magic word community level, and I believe that is how the CDC is framing their uh, recommendations for how we should behave um, in certain spaces. But correct me if I'm wrong, um, those recommendations aren't like, here's how you avoid getting COVID. They're more like, here's how you avoid overwhelming our hospital system. Is that right? right? Yeah, their new system is more based around hospital capacity and some of those kind of safety nets of, you know, the surges where we've had to help support hospitals that were overwhelmed before. So um, kind of looking more at severe infection and hospitalization not as much community spread. Um, for me, I think even anecdotally, the last few weeks I've had a lot more friends and family who have said that they have tested positive. And when I start to hear about it more in my social circles, we will then kind of like retract a little bit. Again, that is our risk tolerance. I'm not technically at risk of severe COVID. I don't have underlying conditions, but I would like to avoid long COVID. Yeah. Um, I, since I talk about it and hear about it all day, every day, I, my risk tolerance is pretty low. Um, so yeah, staying informed and using those layers of protection, risk is not an all or nothing thing. It's, a, it's really a spectrum. Yeah. So trying to think about it, like how many layers can we apply so that it's more in our favor? You know, when case counts got really low and we're doing this wastewater surveillance now, which is really interesting. So when we see there's less community spread, for me, it's like, all right, I'm going to go to a concert again or, you know, I'm going to get together with friends. Um, but that's, it's a personal choice. I think um, it's good to know kind of what your risk tolerance is and if you might be susceptible to more severe infection. But again, if you want to avoid long COVID, it's good to avoid COVID-19. <laughs> Yeah, and I think um, there is a good message there for people, because I think a lot of people, the CDC is authoritative, right? Um, but it doesn't sound like saving us from long COVID is like the goal of the recommendations that people are being told to follow. Um, and so, for instance, like I know I've got immunocompromised people in my family, uh, but I don't always know when those people are going to drop by. Sure. <laughs> and so, it's really, it's up to me to either, you know, get my in-laws to figure out how to notify me ahead of time that they're coming, or just wear a mask at the grocery store, at the concert, or what have you. Because it seems like that advice at, like at the very beginning was maybe like how to avoid getting infected mm -hmm. advice and the how to avoid getting infected advice is the how to avoid long COVID advice. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I think, you know, it was, it was really tight restrictions for a while and there is, there are other impacts of that, right? Social isolation isn't good for people. Um, having lots of extra like cleaning steps and all of these other, you know, mitigation efforts, uh, it's, yeah. it can be a lot for people. So trying to look at it holistically, like, I don't think there is a going back to normal. I think there is kind of going to be a new normal. Um, but just taking all of that into, into account when you're, you're thinking about risk tolerance, we do want to enjoy life also. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think, 
avoiding COVID is uh, information is, is helpful and testing can be really helpful. Um, for us, before we're gonna gather with relatives, we try to make sure we know ahead of time, but okay. we, we may all test before we get together just to make sure that no one is contagious. And yeah. you know, finding information like that can be really empowering. That's a good insight. Maybe I should just have some tests on hand. We got a whole case. box of them yeah. in our cupboard. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm stay I'm, outside. Yeah. Let me test this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's I mean, it, it was a little awkward at Christmas, you know, saying like, well, what's what's the protocol here, like, to keep each other safer, but. Yeah, so hopefully those things will be available for a long time and accessible to people. Yeah. You know, they haven't been accessible to all communities equally throughout this whole pandemic. And that's part of why our concern is that long COVID is going to disproportionately impact communities and populations in the same way that the pandemic has. So you um, mentioned that the $1 billion was for clinical research. And that you are more uh, on the public health and so what are you seeing in terms of like trends, let's say, with regard to long COVID from the public health perspective? Sure, well, we don't have data yet for community specific impacts of long COVID. That's definitely kind of one of our, our main goals for our program. We do know that certain communities, occupations um, had pre-existing disparities before the pandemic. And so it will like, likely widen those inequities. Mm. Um, and we also, um, you know, in talking with some of our healthcare partners at uh, the specialty clinics, they are seeing a very narrow segment of the population in their long COVID specialty clinics. Okay. Um, it tends to be the people who are already have the best access to healthcare. It's oh, like sure. white suburban people, and we know those aren't the only folks being impacted by long COVID. So really what we're seeing is that there's probably a lack of awareness or for that people even have it. They may not realize what they're experiencing is long COVID, mm. um, and probably just not knowing where to go with that or what to do. There, there are resources emerging, but we really need more coordination around that and looking at ways our systems can support people as well. In my mind, I feel like I've, so my grandparents are in North Carolina, and I feel like sometimes people are just sick for a while. You know, it's just he's just been sick for a while. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I love like, that could be literally anything. Um, okay, so that's distressing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, from like maybe kind of the more so the policy perspective, when I think about uh, the disparate impacts of long COVID let's say starting from youth, like then they go into school and uh, inequities already exist in our, in our systems there. And so there is a, a greater chance, let's say a greater opportunity for them to fall behind in school, which means that later on down the road, they're not um, at the same economic level where they could be. And it's, uh, it's kind of a domino effect. Absolutely, yep, and that is a huge concern of ours. We have had conversations with school nurses. We had a big mm. webinar and there were over 100 school nurses on it uh, who wanted to hear about long COVID because it is, it, it can change the trajectory of someone's life. And you know, the way we handle disability in mm. this country, it's, uh, there are a lot of barriers and you know it's not the disability that's the problem it's that the society won't accommodate people so that yeah. they can fully participate and thrive like everyone um so yeah starting very early with schools again with like an adhd diagnosis that you know might actually be long COVID. i mean we we look at the potential of of the intersections of of this with like medical racism and some of these other huge systemic barriers where there's already mistrust and there's already misinformation. Um, being public health, we try to look upstream and that's mm -hmm. part of why we are talking to school nurses and even talking to providers about, you know, it, we, we can't just have specialty centers for people. We need to work with the, the safety net hospitals and clinics community health workers, primary care providers, really the gatekeepers for the healthcare system to make sure they know what to look for. And so that they're documenting this in such a way that people can 
say to their employer, you know, this is affecting my work and I need a flexible schedule or oh, I sure. need to be able to sit down for parts of my shift or, you know, getting those accommodations so that they can continue living their lives. Okay, now I did go to law school and you're talking accommodations and that brings to mind the word disability. Uh -huh. And I think uh, maybe at the intersection of long COVID and disability is people not wanting to talk. <laughs> about what's wrong with them. They, they don't like the D word, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but is that where we are? Have you, you've, you've been in conversations with more people with long COVID than I have. Have you met like people with long COVID who are disabled, who consider themselves to be disabled? Absolutely. Wow. And you're right that not everyone will identify as disabled. I think there is, of course, there's a lot of stigma around that, unfortunately. We'll say in our work thus far, we have talked to so many organizations and members of the dis disability community, and they have been the most incredible partners. Um, just such a wealth of knowledge and lived experience yeah. around this, and they have just informed us so much around what this might look like in policy, in community, in an individual's life. So we've learned a lot about that intersection already, and we have a lot more work to do. Um, but you're right that it is something that are you going to apply for disability stat status and, yeah. and really, you know, go that route. And for some people, it might be their only means of, of keeping their roof over their head, you know. But we are definitely seeing people who are newly disabled from long COVID. I get very moving emails in our mm. programmatic inbox from folks. And I, I follow a lot of activists and advocates on social media and, you know, seeing people say like, my, my fiance left me, I'm not the man I used to be, or, you know, I can't, oh I can't pay my bills anymore. Like I'm at risk of homelessness at this point. I mean, it, it can be that extreme for some people. So it is getting folks to, you know, identify with that so that they can get the support and services, but then also, you know, improving systems so that they're able to get those supports and services. And, and once again, we're talking about the people who are able to get to you as well, you know what I mean? Like the Department of Health website is not that easy to navigate. It is big. <laughs> we have a large agency and we have the, the web pages to show for it. <laughs> and so to find the right program manager who is studying, this is very impressive. But I think about, you know, the people hanging out by the drugstore near my house, they are, they're never gonna find you. Right? You know that they're suffering from long COVID. Absolutely. And that's why we know it's crucial that we are partnering with communities early on in our work. And we are already, I mean, that has been kind of where we've focused a lot of our efforts so far, because we know that it's going to make all of our work much stronger and more effective. We need that input from communities. We, we need um, that partnership. So that is the relationships are largely at the center of, of what we're doing. And that makes it a little slower sometimes because you know we have to do it authentically we don't want to do the thing where we helicopter into a community and get some data or do some surveys and then are like never to be heard from again i think that is just so harmful and um is not going to move the needle on these disparities so we're going to try it a little bit different one of the silver linings of this is that it's so new and um, the way our funding is set up we have a good amount of autonomy um so we're going to be a little bit bold and try to, you know, do it a little different. And yeah. um, I, I think it's really exciting and, and rewarding. Well, it sounds like there are a lot of people who need bold action from your department. And so uh, once again, I find myself expressing gratitude to you <laughs> for the work that you do. But right now, I think we're going to take another quick coffee break. And then there are a few more uh, questions I have in this interrogation on long COVID if you're up for it. I am so up for it. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. You bet. We are back with Kate Murray, long COVID program manager for the Minnesota Department of Health. Now, Kate, I think we understand that we don't have all of the answers on long COVID yet. You're working on it. Um, but if I think that I have long COVID, what should I do? Yeah, so 
Best case scenario is you would talk to your healthcare provider about it, and we do have some resources linked on our website to help people prepare for those appointments, okay. and that can help like track your symptoms over time, kind of you know mark when you maybe had your initial infection, and then you're going in with the information kind of at the ready. That being said, we know that providers are still learning about this too. I was about to ask you, are they getting better? I think they are getting better, and there are more kind of national efforts around this. There's even, you know, in Congress, there's some talk about national guidelines and that sort of thing, but they're going to be a ways out, so we do have some work to do. But that would be the best case scenario. If it's something that is impacting your job or schoolwork, uh, one thing to know is that long COVID does, um, can under the Americans with Disabilities Act qualify as a disability. And so your employer may actually be required to provide accommodations if oh. they are able. So we also have uh, resources on our website for that, um, including for navigators and advocates to help with some of that paperwork. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of paperwork. It is a lot of paperwork. So have, you, have you spoken directly with providers? Yes, we have talked to both primary care providers and folks at the specialty care clinics, as well as um, hospital systems and clinics out in greater Minnesota, um, who are also seeing this and just trying to get a sense of what their approaches are for this. And another one of our goals is convening those providers so that we have a more consistent approach in Minnesota. What do you tell them to look out for when you're on? Well, we have our, you know, massive list of symptoms. I was like 200 symptoms Yeah, or we just right? list them all. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for, since so many people don't even necessarily recognize that this is what it might be that they're experiencing, sometimes it, they sort of come in for something else and then the provider realizes, oh, this is actually mm. long COVID. And we've heard that from um, some of the navigators for disability benefits and accommodations as well, where someone comes in for job accommodations and as they describe what their experience is, realize it is probably long COVID. So my guess then, I'm trying to track this in my mind, because most people I imagine who have like super mild cases of COVID-19 or maybe who are vaccinated and boosted, get your vaccine and get your booster, uh, and have the asymptomatic or incredibly mild cases aren't gonna go to their doctor because they've had COVID-19, which means it won't be in their chart or what have you. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing there's like a push to update that list of things that you have to circle yes or no on on the chart to say, yes, I do think I've had COVID-19 or, or no or what have you. Um, and then you'd go, you're seen by the nurse, the doctor, and you describe your symptoms. And is it on us to tell the doctor that we think we have long COVID? Or is it on the doctor to let us know that they think we have long COVID? <laughs> right. Well, I think, you know, in a perfect world, it would probably be the latter. Um, but there are a lot of patients who have needed to advocate for themselves and, mm. and bring this up. And, you know, in a world of Dr. Google, it's understandable that some, some providers are, you know, a little wary of, well, I saw this on the Internet and I think it's what I have. But when it's something kind of as mysterious as long COVID, there's a lot of information out there. I think if it's impacting their life, it's something that should be pursued. And what the provider would probably do is do different tests or um, diagnostics to eliminate other potential causes of these underlying symptoms. It's often more of a process of elimination since we don't have one test for long COVID. So even if they don't right away arrive at that conclusion, they may eventually get there as they rule out other Okay, hey, now we talked about accessibility, mm -hmm. and when you say lots of tests, that sounds very expensive. Yes, to it me. does, <laughs> and that's why it's also important we're talking to payers and those health systems about how important it is to make sure these things are covered for people. And you know, of course, that's easier said than done, yeah. and we don't live in this like society with infinite resources for our medical system, um, but. As some of those protocols get a little more standardized, I think that'll help too. So it's not just like someone who's sure. like, we're gonna try everything in, in the book. Like, no, there is really good reason to try to eliminate these other potential causes. And I think um, you're saying something that it's really just starting to sit with me. The number of people who are going to contract long COVID 
is so large that our healthcare system, the notoriously reluctant to change American healthcare system, is going to adjust to accommodate like this huge number of people that are going to have uh, post-acute sequelae. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. You know, I think <clears throat> there's a lot of fear that um, we'll just find a way to keep stay the course. Okay, and okay. you know, we have a very a, a fragmented healthcare system. So even you know, trying to study anonymous uh, electronic health records to understand like where symptoms might be kind of trending up or those sorts of things, it's hard. It's very you know separate. Um, but we do think this is going to be probably a pretty a pretty big impact overall. And it is, it's hard, it's in this gray area of like, well, you have symptoms, but you can live with it. So like, mm. are you gonna go to the doctor for that? If it's just like your sense of smell is off for a year and you know, sometimes it has to get to like this tipping point before people will go to a doctor. Yeah. So uh, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm sorry, I can't totally answer that question. It's okay, I'll have you back on. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I have some unresolved questions for you. <laughs> Uh, it's really funny. This is just a fun anecdote relating to the sense of smell. Um, I was, uh, I have a podcast, Bottomless Coffee Podcast, and I was talking with this guy uh, about colorectal cancer, like medical conversation. Um, after the episode is over, we're all still talking about COVID. And he's like, oh, yeah, I, I wasn't able to smell anything for like nine months. And then, you know, one day I was in my car and I farted and I was like, <gasps> <laughs> Silver linings. So I, I, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. And um, that, that is something that only sounds like an inconvenience in ways, but right. we do know some people, it makes food taste terrible. And then yeah. they will lose a lot of weight because they just don't find food appetizing anymore. And I love food and good food, and it's like part of joy of life. So, yeah. you know, it is. Some of those less like concrete impacts are are important too. I mean, I've only got five senses, and I'd like for them all to function. Yes, yes. <laughs> As they were designed to function. I have a friend who didn't uh, like the smell or taste of coffee for a while um, afterwards, and you know, still a friend. Yeah, <laughs> still I a friend, but it was a near thing. It was a near thing. Okay, um, I have another anecdote. I was at a trash cleanup in a neighborhood. This was. COVID-1, let's say, and someone was not masked and like very much in my business, you know, and he was like, it's okay. I've had, uh, I've been taking like elderflower extract or something. And so there's misinformation, you know, you mentioned the internet. Uh, sure, it might lead you to tell your doctor that you have long COVID or like, I don't know, frostbite or something weird like that. <laughs> um, but it might also lead you to think that you are immune or somehow protected in ways that you are not. And it can lead to like fraudsters, and shysters and the like. So, oh, yes. and I think there's a history of people preying on the sick and the disabled. And I, my gut tells me that long COVID is an area where people could totally take advantage of people who are just looking for some relief or some help, especially if their primary care physician uh, doesn't believe them when they come and they say, there's something wrong. So, Kate, if you had long COVID, you just knew you had it, and this private company was offering to like help you with your symptoms, like what would you look for in this company to know if they were legit? Sure, <clears throat> and you're right. There, there is just a proliferation of people who think they have the answers out there. And Snake oil salesman. Yeah, yeah, and it's understandable for people with long COVID who are just not getting answers anywhere and running into these roadblocks, they're, they're desperate for some relief. So I certainly don't blame anyone for looking for, you know, other miracle cures. Yeah. And we see it in some of like the support groups online, which are really important for people's mental health, but they will be recommending like mega dosing vitamins or there's, you know, people who will do intravenous vitamin treatments and mm. stuff in your home. And there's a company that is, uh, has a particular diagnostic type test for long COVID. Okay. Um, and it's very expensive and they will is. be happy to take your money. I think some of the red flags are that I think they find like 95% of the people who take the test comes back positive. 
Mm. And there's going to be some like bias in that just because of the way people are submitting it, but that's suspiciously high. Yeah. And I think looking for providers who have been working with people and, and coordinating care for them um, with long COVID for some time is going to be a better bet um, than random information on the internet. Because it can be it can be just a waste of money or it can really be harmful. I mean, megadosing vitamins and how that can interact with other medications and whatnot, mm. that can be pretty dangerous. So avoid, avoid that. Avoid doctors trying to give you ivermectin. Um, Oh, you know, sure. some yeah. of those, those other red flags. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, always good to know what red flags to look for. Um, I think I am dangerously low on coffee. So we are going to take one more quick coffee break and then be right back. Hi, everyone. I hope that you're enjoying the conversation. I just wanted to stop in and provide a quick update on our efforts to become a healing television show. Now, real talk, I am not one to reinvent the wheel and I am a bookworm. So my first instinct was to look to see if there were any books written on the subject and lucky us, I found out that a very famous talk show host has partnered with a mental health professional to write a book on trauma and healing. From what I've read so far, they start out with the biology of the brain, move on to help trauma and oppression show up as biological responses to external stimuli, and then they dedicate the final chapters to resolving trauma and healing. Now, since we're all in this together, and since we've all shared a number of traumatic experiences, I have started working through the book and sharing what I've learned on our podcast, Bottomless Coffee Podcast. My goal, is to become a trauma-informed talk show and podcast host, to help other people navigate the traumas that they come across in their own lives and in their communities, and to get us all thinking about actually healing from our shared traumatic experiences. I hope that you'll join us. You can find episodes at bottomlesscoffeeshow.com, and we are also streaming on all major podcast platforms. I'll see you there. Kate, thank you so much for being here. You really dropped some knowledge on us today. Um, and everyone should know the answer to this by now, but just in case, there is one thing that we can do to avoid getting long COVID. What is it? Avoid COVID-19 and get vaccinated. Keep up with those boosters. And that is such an important layer of protection. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Really grateful for this conversation. Really glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Yay.